Republican and Democratic presidents alike, from Harry Truman to George Bush, stood for freedom and stood for certain propositions that would make America strong and healthy and grow the middle class and shrink poverty and stand against communism. And after 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. You were both in skull and bone of the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go on. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the rest Number 322. Two. <laughs> uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but, uh, look, I look forward... Are you prepared to lose? No, I'm not going to lose. You both were members of Spell and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution, and 92% that's at least nine out of ten of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution. Shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart. But the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than 9 out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind-blowing. But let's look at it another way, because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. Teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism. All the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream we asked everyone about. Something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor, since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of ten people, 92%, said this was a nice, ideal distribution of America's wealth. 
But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30 percent are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly a hundred times that of the poorest Americans, and about ten times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change, and the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10 percent are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5 percent are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1 percent, this guy, well, his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own, because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, 8 out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1% take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976, they took home only 9%, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money, but do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee? N not his lowest paid employee, not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. Every human on this planet is enslaved, whether they know it or not. This is not the crude and primitive slavery of ancient times. It does not rely on whips and shackles to keep the oppressed in their place. These tools have been rendered obsolete by much more sophisticated methods. That most of the enslaved are unaware of their condition and would in fact argue fiercely that they are free is a testament to the effectiveness of these invisible chains. You've heard the expression, money makes the world go round. There's truth in that. Money is the prime motive for human labor in modern civilization. If you want food, shelter, and clothing, you must have money. And unless you're part of that tiny minority that has more money than they could ever spend in their lifetime, then you must work, beg, or steal for that money. That's why you get up in the morning and go to work, even if you hate your job. And that's why the specter of unemployment is more terrifying for most people than the prospect of spending 50 years of their life performing menial tasks within the confines of a fluorescent-lit cubicle. Of course, in Western countries, some are fortunate enough to have pulled away from the brink and do not live in fear that their basic needs will be met, at least for now. And yet they keep spinning the hamster wheel. Why is that? Could it be because money and the bling that it buys have become symbols of status and prestige? Money offers an illusory form of social validation, but even those who are not caught up in distinguishing themselves by how much they accumulate still must acknowledge the social stigma that comes with poverty. The combination of these primal motivators, the need for food, shelter, clothing, and social validation, is a very powerful force. It's enough to drive humans to engage in all forms of activity, even to the point of harming themselves or others in the process. 
The accumulation of money is therefore an accumulation of social and psychological power. And those who control the creation of money control this power at its source. So who controls the creation of money? Well, in the case of the US dollar, it's not the government. This shouldn't be an earth-shattering revelation. The fact that the Federal Reserve is a private institution owned by a cartel of the world's most powerful banks is quickly becoming common knowledge. Even the mainstream media doesn't deny it at this point. However, the full extent of what this means is only clear when you understand how the banking system really works. And unfortunately, this isn't something we're taught in school. Once you have it explained to you in simple terms, you'll understand why. Every dollar in circulation is loaned into existence by a bank. The process begins with the Federal Reserve when they loan out money to the U.S. government and to other entities. You've probably heard this talked about before, especially in regards to the interest rate on those loans, which the Federal Reserve raises and lowers depending on economic conditions. But what's never talked about in the mainstream is the fact that the Fed isn't actually loaning out money that they have. They are merely typing those dollars into existence on a computer. You may be inclined to believe that this money is based on some physical backing like gold, but you would be mistaken. The Federal Reserve hasn't owned any gold since the 1930s. We don't. The Federal Reserve does not own any gold at all. We have not owned gold since 1934. Um, so we have not engaged in any gold swaps. When the Federal Reserve loans money to the U.S. government, the U.S. government gives the Federal Reserve government bonds in exchange. These bonds are simply written promises to pay back the money that was loaned to them with interest through taxation. So to be clear here, the government is taking out a loan from a bank that is creating that money out of thin air, and they're expecting you, the taxpayer, to cover that loan. The absurdity of this arrangement is even more obvious when you realize that up until 1913, the U.S. government created its own money and had no need for a bank to play the part of a middleman. That new money loaned out by the Federal Reserve enters circulation through the banks, accumulates in the banks, and in the end, the banks end up holding all the cards, not necessarily for the reasons you may imagine. Contrary to popular belief, the majority of money in circulation isn't actually created by the Federal Reserve, but rather by the ordinary banks that businesses and individuals use for their checking, savings, and mortgages. How is this possible? Well, like the Federal Reserve, ordinary banks are allowed to loan out money that they don't have. There are, of course, restrictions. Banks are only allowed to loan out 10 times the amount of money that they actually have. So if Wells Fargo has $1,000, they can loan you $10,000, and they expect you to pay back that $10,000 plus interest. This is called fractional reserve banking. 75% of all money in circulation is created in this manner. Now, as bad as this may seem, this is really only the tip of the iceberg. Most banks structure payment plans so that for many years, you're paying almost nothing but interest and only start paying down the principal gradually. The result of this strategy is that in most cases, you pay far more in interest when you purchase a house than the house itself is worth. So here's the real question. If all money is created through loans, where does the money come from to pay for the interest? Let's say we reset the system to zero, loan $1,000 into existence, and charge 7% interest. We now have a total of $1,000 in the system, but we owe $1,000 plus interest, and that's more. The interest ensures that there's always more debt than money in circulation, because the money to pay the interest doesn't exist, never has, never will. This would be obvious if there was only one loan being issued to one person in this manner. But when performed on a global scale, the reality is hidden and is transformed into a game of musical chairs where the person ending up without a seat faces bankruptcy and financial ruin. Because every dollar in existence is tied to a debt, this creates an unseen force that draws those dollars back to the banks. Kind of like gravity attracts a physical object to Earth. The catch here is that it's the labor of the people that moves that money. Every hour that you work to pay back a loan or to keep the government from throwing you in jail over income taxes is an hour worked for the banks. The total receipts from personal income taxes just barely covers the interest on the national debt. And even the principal for that debt all ends up back in the hands of the banks. And remember, that bank created that money out of nothing. Once you understand that the money that banks loan out isn't actually an asset, but is in fact a piece of legal fiction, it should be clear that you're working for these banks for free. This is a cleverly disguised form of slavery. If you manage to pay your monthly payments, then you are a successful slave, and you are allowed to keep the material comforts that come with that status. But if for some reason you fail to make those monthly payments, then the bank or the IRS comes to take your house, your car, and anything else you have of value. And if somehow, even with this enormous financial advantage, the banks still get themselves into trouble, you, the taxpayer, will be forced to bail them out. No matter what, the banks win. To say the game is rigged, is an understatement. You might be inclined to think that if you live outside the United States and you don't use dollars, then this situation has no bearing on your life. But you would be wrong. 
The dollar is both the world reserve currency and the only currency in which oil is sold on global markets. This is often referred to as the petrodollar status. This means that wherever you live, whether your country is an oil exporter or an oil importer, you are affected. If your country is an oil importer, then you are affected by the fact that in order to keep your country running, you have to acquire dollars. To acquire those dollars, you have to send goods and services to the United States or to someone else who did. Likewise, if your country is an oil exporter, you are affected by the fact that you send your oil to the U.S. in exchange for this debt-based money. You are exchanging something of real and tangible value for digits on a screen. And if for some reason the leadership of your country grows tired of this arrangement and tries to pull off the dollar, you'll quickly find the United States military at your doorstep ready to open up a can of democracy on you. Iraq learned this the hard way when they switched their oil sales to euros in 2000, and Libya when they tried to organize a gold-based currency for Africa. Debt-based money is a masterpiece of social engineering, the ultimate tool of the ruling elite. Yet in reality, the whole thing is nothing more than a construct of belief. Our chains are the chains of the mind, and the path to freedom must also begin in the mind. If we want a better future for our children and grandchildren, then we must work right now to reach a critical mass of awakening. Why did the United States attack Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Yemen? Why are U.S. operatives helping to destabilize Syria? And why is the United States government so intent on taking down Iran, in spite of the fact that Iran has not attacked any country since 1798? And what's next? What are we headed for? When you look at the current trajectory that we're on, it doesn't make any sense at all if you evaluate it based on what we're taught in school. And it doesn't make any sense if you base your worldview on the propaganda that the mainstream media tries to pass off as news. But it makes perfect sense once you know the real motives of the powers that be. In order to understand those motives, we first have to take a look at history. In 1945, the Bretton Woods Agreement established the dollar as the world reserve currency, which meant that international commodities were priced in dollars. The agreement, which gave the United States a distinct financial advantage, was made under the condition that those dollars would remain redeemable for gold at a consistent rate of $35 per ounce. The United States promised not to print very much money, but this was on the honor system, because the Federal Reserve refused to allow any audits or supervision of its printing presses. In the years leading up to 1970, expenditures in the Vietnam War made it clear to many countries that the U.S. was printing far more money than it had in gold. And in response, they began to ask for their gold back. This of course set off a rapid decline in the value of the dollar. The situation climaxed in 1971 when France attempted to withdraw its gold and Nixon refused. On August 15th, he made the following announcement. I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. The United States. This was obviously not a temporary suspension, as he claimed, but rather a permanent default. And for the rest of the world who had entrusted the United States with their gold, it was outright theft. In 1973, President Nixon asked King Faisal of Saudi Arabia to accept only U.S. dollars as payment for oil and to invest any excess profits in U.S. Treasury bonds, notes, and bills. In return, Nixon offered military protection for Saudi oil fields. The same offer was extended to each of the world's key oil producing countries, and by 1975, every member of OPEC had agreed to only sell their oil in US dollars. The act of moving the dollar off of gold and tying it to foreign oil instantly forced every oil importing country in the world to start maintaining a constant supply of Federal Reserve paper. And in order to get that paper, they would have to send real physical goods to America. This was the birth of the petrodollar. Paper went out, everything America needed came in, and the United States got very, very rich as a result. It was the largest financial con in recorded history. The arms race of the Cold War was a game of poker. Military expenditures were the chips, and the U.S. had an endless supply of chips. With the petrodollar under its belt, it was able to raise the stakes higher and higher, outspending every other country on the planet, until eventually U.S. military expenditures surpassed that of all other nations in the world combined. The Soviet Union never had a chance. The collapse of the communist bloc in 1991 
removed the last counterbalance to American military might. The United States was now an undisputed superpower with no rival. Many hoped that this would mark the beginning of a new era of peace and stability. Unfortunately, there were those in high places who had other ideas. Within that same year, the U.S. invaded Iraq in the first Gulf War. And after crushing the Iraqi military and destroying their infrastructure, including water purification plants and hospitals, crippling sanctions were imposed which prevented that infrastructure from being rebuilt. These sanctions, which were initiated by Bush Sr. and sustained throughout the entire Clinton administration, lasted for over a decade and were estimated to have killed over 500,000 children. The Clinton administration was fully aware of these figures. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Worth it, worth it. Ms. Albright, what exactly was it that was worth killing 500,000 kids for? In November of 2000, Iraq began selling its oil exclusively in euros. This was a direct attack on the dollar and on U.S. financial dominance, and it wasn't going to be tolerated. In response, the U.S. government, with the assistance of the mainstream media, began to build up a massive propaganda campaign claiming that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and was planning to use them. In 2003, the U.S. invaded, and once they had control of the country, oil sales were immediately switched back to dollars. This is particularly notable due to the fact that switching back to the dollar meant a 15 to 20 percent loss in revenue due to the euro's higher value. It doesn't make any sense at all unless you take the petrodollar into account. To preserve our independence, we must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. We must make our choice between economy and liberty or profusion and servitude. Wow. I place economy among the first and most important of Republican virtues, and public debt is the greatest of the dangers to be feared. It is incumbent on every generation to pay its own debts as it goes. We must have a central bank to secure this country's finances. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their money, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless on the very continent their fathers conquered. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence. What's happening? Where am I? I believe perhaps you understand now, Biles. 
but you are afraid. JFK, Hartman, what does this have to do with my house and my dog? Oh, okay, that's enough. I, I want to go home now. This is the last president to stand up to the Fed. You must see. On June 4, 1963, President Kennedy signed Executive Order 11110. This executive order empowered the U.S. Treasury to issue real money without the Fed. It would have worked. Kennedy's plan to dismantle the Federal Reserve machine had begun. But six months later, John F. Kennedy went to Dallas and never returned. No way. No way they could do that. The new president. Lyndon Johnson threw out Kennedy's order. And since JFK, no president has dared confront the secret powers behind the Federal Reserve. They consolidate bigger and bigger banks, print more and more money accountable to no one, decimating our nation's wealth for the benefit of a few. Why? Why do this?
But anyway, I've had people calling me saying they go out to their mailbox and they find a little red dot or a little blue dot on their mailbox and they wonder what the little red dot and blue dot is. Well, it's marking your mailbox by the government so when foreign troops come in here on us after martial law, if you have a red dot on your mailbox, they take you out immediately and shoot you right in the head. But if you have a blue dot, they take you to the FEMA camps being built by Halliburton right now to house 50 million Americans. They're building enough concentration camps in America by Halliburton that Cheney's getting rich off of, Vice President Cheney's getting rich off of, to put those with the blue dot on your mailbox in those concentration camps. Now, if you go out and you find a pink dot, on your mailbox, that means that they believe you'll be a good slave and you're going to go along with the program and serve our international antichrist masters. So watch for that dot. Have you heard that the Department of Homeland Security has purchased 1.6 billion rounds of ammunition last year? I mean, that's got to cost millions and millions of dollars. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't this country broke? I mean, you turn on the TV, you hear how we're laying off air traffic controllers, how people are going to die because of it. I mean, Harrison Ford is in a tizzy, and we're spending this much money on bullets? Do you know that 1.6 billion rounds of ammunition is enough to fight a 20-year war and still have bullets left over? My question is, who is the Department of Homeland Security planning to shoot? Do you realize that over the past couple of months, our government has tried to pass bills through Congress allowing them to arrest American citizens without due process, allowing them to kill American citizens without due process. An ad hoc legal approach for fighting terrorism. President Obama today proposed something new, something called prolonged detention. Doesn't sound that bad, right? Prolonged detention? Did you ever see the movie Minority Report? It was based on a Philip K. Dick short story. It came out in 2002. It starred Tom Cruise, remember? He played a police officer in something called the Department of Pre-Crime. Pre-Crime is where people are arrested and incarcerated to prevent crimes that they have not yet committed. Mr. Marks. My mandate of the District of Columbia Pre-Crime Division. I'm placing you under arrest for the future murder of Sarah Marks and Donald Dubinos. Take place today, April 22nd, at 0800 hours, four minutes. No, I didn't do anything. You didn't do anything, but you're gonna. Future murder. Creepy, right? Putting somebody in jail, not for what they've done, but for what you're very sure they're going to do? There may be a number of people who cannot be prosecuted for past crimes. In some cases, because evidence may be tainted. But who nonetheless pose a threat to the security of the United States. We're not prosecuting them for past crimes, but we need to keep them in prison because of our expectation of their future crimes. Al-Qaeda terrorists and their affiliates are at war with the United States, and those that we capture, like other prisoners of war, must be prevented from attacking us again. Prevented. We will incarcerate people preventively. Preventive incarceration indefinite detention without trial that's what that's what this is that's what president obama proposed today if you strip away the euphemisms one civil liberties advocate told the new york times today quote we've known this was on the horizon for many years but we were able to hold it off with george bush the idea that we might find ourselves fighting with the obama administration over these powers is really stunning and it is stunning and uh, it's got the five regions for the fema camps and it talks about barricades and barbed wire and, 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 and armed guards. And uh, it, it says that they've built the camps and that now they need to get ready to staff them. And that they need to be ready within a 72-hour period. And so I want to challenge everybody to call their friends and their families now. And realize that the new economy is to put tens of millions of people, we already have the biggest prison population in the world, in, in, this, in this archipelago, this, 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 this giant chain of facilities all over the country. The following video details the contents of a Department of Defense document entitled Internment and Resettlement Operations, also known as FM 3-39.40.
The document is 325 pages long and it is signed by Joyce E. Morrow, Administrative Assistant to the Secretary of the Army. It was created in 2010, however, it's just been recently leaked to the public via the internet and can now be downloaded from multiple sources. In the description below, you'll find a download link for the document. I strongly encourage you to download it yourself and to verify everything that's being said here. The document outlines military procedures for internment and resettlement of civilians, and it describes the layout and the administration of these internment camps. It clearly states on page 38 that it applies within U.S. territory, and it specifically addresses the detainment of U.S. citizens, as is indicated by the identification procedures for new prisoners on page 146, which states that social security numbers are to be recorded alongside their photograph and fingerprints. Included in the list of organizations which may be involved in these internment operations are the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, the Department of Defense, and the United Nations. On page 56, the document outlines the responsibilities of psychological operations officers within the camps, among which it states that a PSYOP officer develops and executes indoctrination programs to reduce or remove antagonistic attitudes and identifies political activists. On page 281, the document goes into more detail regarding the role of psychological operations within the camp, specifically in regards to pacifying the population and ensuring cooperation. On page 238, it gives the conditions for the use of deadly force in such camps. Among the justifications for lethal force, it includes to terminate an active escape attempt. That point right there should make it clear that these camps are not benevolent disaster relief type facilities. On page 244, the document calls for the use of snipers during riots to, quote, scan a crowd and identify agitators and riot leaders for apprehension and fire lethal rounds if warranted. On page 260, it shows the basic layout for a facility focusing on detainment. It is depicted with interrogation areas, tribunal areas, and mortuaries. Each detainment facility is designed to hold 4,000 prisoners, and they are depicted with multiple levels of barbed wire separating compartments within the facilities, with a double barbed wire fence enclosing them, and watched over by 24 guard towers. On page 261, the document depicts the layout for what they call civilian resettlement facilities, which are designed to house 8,000 people. Though it uses the word resettlement, the plans show multiple levels of barbed wire dividing the sections of the facility, with double barbed wire fencing on the outside, as well as 16 guard towers. On page 262, the layout for facilities designed for what they call non-compliant prisoners is shown. These camps are designed to hold up to 300 prisoners, they have three interrogation centers, and are guarded by 13 guard towers. Now, if there's any question whether these plans are active or just theoretical, this should be settled by the fact that the U.S. Army has been running ads for job positions in these camps since 2009, and apparently, they're still hiring. Once again, if you look in the description, you'll find all the links you need to verify this information. It's important to note here that this document was created in 2010, which was under the Obama administration, and it predates the NDAA of 2012, which authorized military detainment of U.S. citizens. This clearly shows a long-term agenda at work. Listen to this, folks. I was pulled to the side road, which was uh, uh, a new cut gravel dirt road in front of a business, a builder supply business. And the right side of the road was filled with, uh, which I thought was portable toilet store. I never looked at them that close. Same in color, maybe black, but which was an odd color. And I asked him about the, the field of black boxes. What, what were they? Because uh, I'd never seen anything like that. And, uh, and his statement was that if he told me, I would be one of few people in Madison, Georgia, that knew about them. And he says they're, they're uh, disposable coffins, I believe he told me. And he says uh, there's a hundred, at that time, he said there was 125,000 there. And the brother of the man that owns this field, that the government is leasing this field from, to store these disposable coffins, this brother has been, was given three years to set up temporary morgues around the country.
we now have a policy as exemplified by the FBI brochure from the on counterterrorism which says people who are defenders of the US Constitution against federal government and the UN and make numerous references to the US Constitution should be monitored as potentially murderous and fanatical terrorists Department of Justice memo, which tells local police what should you be looking out for in kind of everyday terrorism prevention and terrorism watch uh, um, activities. And one of the things that is considered a potential terrorist risk is individuals who harbor doubts about the official story regarding 9-11. The memo adds 9-11 official story skeptics to the growing list of targets. If you go outside the city of Atlanta, go east about 60 or 70 miles to the town of Elberton, and then go north on Highway 77, about 10 miles, you'll find off to the right what's called the Georgia Guidestones. It looks kind of like Stonehenge, these big, huge granite rocks set up there. This was done by a guy, we have a pseudonym, came in, paid cash, had this company set these things up in 1980. He called himself R.C. Christian, uh, but that's not his real name. It says right on the stones, a pseudonym, false name. On these Georgia Guidestones, it gives the Ten Commandments for the New World Order. Ten Commandments for the New World Order. The, fir the first commandment, was to maintain humanity under a half billion. I went there and looked at those things and said, now, hold on a minute. Today's population is six billion. They want to maintain humanity under one half billion. Looks like a lot of people got to die for their plan to work, which is, by the way, the plan. Jacques Cousteau said we'd have to eliminate 350,000 people a day. A third of a million people a day would have to be eliminated to save Mother Earth. Uh, Bill Clinton said we need to reduce the population of the Earth to one billion. There are a lot of folks who would like to reduce the population of the Earth. The Bible command is quite the opposite. My friends, the information that you are about to witness from all of my years of research is the most important. It's been hidden in plain view the entire time. This is the ultimate secret and it's about to be exposed. I have hundreds of government documents, textbooks, white papers, where for over 80 years, the elite of the Western world have talked about adulterating food and water to sicken and sterilize the population for the purpose of eugenics. It's all covered in the book, Eco Science, written by the White House science czar, John P. Holdren, where they talk about a planetary police state to carry out the forced sterilization. They also talk about covert systems in the water and food to sterilize the population. Now this was written decades ago, before he was White House science czar. Now suddenly, the stuff in this book is all over the news. They're selling it to the public as if it's a good thing. 
You see here before you what an average person would buy when they went shopping at the store. Not everything here is bad for you, but much of it has compounds and artificial chemicals that have been added that are extremely toxic and bad for your health. And they have known this the entire time and they have approved them for use. Let's start with aspartame. You cannot go to the grocery store now and buy any type of even regular sugar gum that hasn't had aspartame added to it. In the 1970s, Searle tried to get it approved and they couldn't. It took them three separate times because in their own studies with monkeys, large portions of them that were fed it died and contracted cancer. Now we have mainstream news articles and the EU has done a major study finding lower birth weights, early birth, and yes, miscarriages from women that drink aspartame-laden soft drinks like Coke Zero. What is aspartame? It is the fecal matter of the E. coli bacteria. They took it and genetically engineered it. They can feed it toxic waste and then it defecates aspartame. And it has so many bad health effects, it's just unspeakable. This is being done by design. It's also very, very addictive. But let's just go ahead and move away from aspartame and talk about McDonald's and chicken McNuggets. Now, I remember a decade ago or so reading health advisories claiming that a form of plastic uh, that's used in silly putty, basically a type of silicone, was in the chicken McNuggets, but also in many other TV dinners and other foods. It is illegal in every other nation in the world to add these chemicals to the food, but it's not in the United States. The big secret is all of this was done by design by the FDA. Look at all the drugs they've approved, and then it comes out later that they knowingly approve them when these drugs are causing heart attacks and cancer. In the Nuremberg trials, it came out that the Nazis were adding sodium fluoride to the water supply in the labor camps and death camps to make the population more docile and controllable. There had been hundreds of university studies before Hitler even came to power. This is a form of forced medication. They admit that one part per million of sodium fluoride more than doubles the chance of bone cancer in boys and men. As the public became educated in the last few decades, the government industry's response was to not just put it in water, but to start adding it to thousands of products like children's water that's mixed with their formula or with their cereal. They started adding as much as 900 parts per million in things like powdered eggs. It causes reductions in IQ. It increases sterility or lack of fertility. And it's being added to so many of the daily staples that we consume. We'll get back to food additives in a moment. But first, I wanted to look at genetically modified organisms. Did you know for many years the American people have been eating cloned beef and pork, and now they're expanding out into other forms of meat? Let's look at salmon first. Major university studies conclusively have proven that the type of genetically modified salmon that is actually a cross species, they've mixed other uh, animal genes in with it, that when this fish is introduced with wild natural salmon, within 40 generations, all the natural salmon are extinct. And the FDA approved this. And they're going to allow it to be released into the wild that isn't even a salmon. It is a cross species chimera. It is a mixture like something out of the island of Dr. Maru, something out of a nightmare. More than 85% of the corn now consumed in the United States, and it's also starting to trend that way in Europe and Canada, is genetically engineered. It grows its own pesticide uh, within the corn kernels so that insects won't eat it. If the insects can't eat this and live, what do you think is going to happen when lab rats or humans eat it? 
we have literally hundreds of studies showing that not just Monsanto's, but other major GMO companies' corn, that's the majority of corn we're now eating today in the United States, has been linked to organ failure in lab animals. The studies also show massive increases in sterility in rats and guinea pigs that are fed not just GMO corn, but GMO cotton seeds. Studies in India, Germany, and the United States have conclusively shown that when they feed the cotton seeds left over from the cotton crop from these genetically modified varieties, that the cows are having miscarriages, they are having low birth weights, or in many cases, they're simply dying. And what is in most processed foods? Genetically modified cottonseed oil. Major studies are also showing that genetically engineered crops are killing honeybees and monarch butterflies. But they don't stop there. Now they claim they're coming out with a genetically engineered mosquito that's malaria-proof that they're going to release into the open biosphere. The very genetic code of the planet is being butchered in a hostile corporate takeover. Many years ago, an executive from Monsanto was quoted in National Geographic as saying that that is their program that they want to basically have their crops and their organisms take over the entire biosphere of this planet. And the major genetic engineer companies have focused mainly on eight major food crops. Now they're expanding out into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other plants, literally changing the genetic code of the planet. This is a genetic dictatorship. This is genetic vandalism. And that's why the Rockefellers, the United Nations, and others have built these giant armored seed vaults all over the world, not just at the Arctic Circle. And they admit they're doing it in case all of this gets out of hand, that they'll have a type of no was ARC. So all these fake environmental groups, they never complain about this. They never talk about true environmental degradation. They want to put a tax on carbon dioxide that humans exhale, that plants respirate from and carry out photosynthesis with as a way to shut down industrial society and control every facet of our lives. That's the big secret. This is a population reduction program. It is an epidemic. The sperm count has dropped in the Western world exponentially. Even the government has been predicting within another generation, almost everyone is going to be sterile. This is the globalist religion. This is their philosophy. They want the planet for themselves. The UN has said that their stated plan is an 80% population reduction. There's been a bit of an uproar this past week due to Obama's signing of a recent bill that has become affectionately labeled the Monsanto Protection Act or H.R. 933. So much so that it's led Senator Barbara Mikulski to publicly apologize for letting the provisions slip through. However, this is really only a small part of a much bigger pattern of corruption and collusion between Monsanto and the U.S. government. Senator Roy Blunt, a Republican from Missouri, who crafted the wording for H.R. 933, has been accused by Senator John Tester of having collaborated directly with Monsanto in the creation of the provision. This shouldn't be surprising considering that Monsanto is one of Blunt's top campaign contributors. Blunt also accepts contributions from the Crawford Group, a registered lobbyist for Monsanto. Now, the controversy in this bill is tied to Section 735, which is, of course, written in such a jumble of incomprehensible legalese that it's highly difficult to interpret. It's designed to make the eyes glaze over without registering that anything of significance has been stated. This is facilitated using a common legislative technique of referring to sections of a separate law so that you have to go read the unintelligible fine print in that second document in order to understand what's actually being said. That second law in this case is the Plant Protection Act. In the description of this video, you will find a link to both documents. Now, what Section 735 of H.R. 933 states is that if a plant is determined to be a biological pest and is therefore brought under regulation and restrictions which prevent it from being planted or transported within the U.S., the Secretary of Agriculture shall immediately grant a temporary permit or deregulation to any farmer, farm operator, or producer that requests it, regardless of what any other laws or courts may order. Now, the word genetically modified organism isn't mentioned here, and that's part of the skillful way that this was designed to slip through. Only someone who knows that by default genetically modified organisms are considered biological pests until they've been approved by the Department of Agriculture, and that they are reclassified as pests if shown unsafe, would understand the implications here. To distill this down to one sentence, if a farmer wants to grow a genetically modified plant that's been outlawed because it's been found to be harmful to the environment or human health, all they need to do is contact the Secretary of Agriculture and they will be immediately issued a permit to cultivate these plants. Essentially, it makes it impossible to stop a genetically modified plant from being used in the United States, regardless of any laws or rulings that are made to outlaw them.